This is the rabbit hole iceberg. Google defines a rabbit hole as a bizarre, confusing, or nonsensical situation. And this iceberg chart has a lot of that. I've been making iceberg chart videos for a while now, and I can say that this chart has some of the most interesting and strange stuff I've really ever seen. And there are a handful of topics on this iceberg chart that are genuinely very unsettling to me. This iceberg chart has so much strange stuff on it. It is so dense, and you could probably drop a five hour video essay on any single one of these entries. Now, before we get into this, there there are a couple things that I want to quickly mention. Of course, there is a lot of stuff on this iceberg chart. While covering this iceberg chart, I want to keep a pretty good pace going through these things. You know, I don't want to get bogged down on any single one of these entries for too long. And so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. When I talk about these entries, I'm mainly going to give kind of a summary of what's going on. You know, I kind of want to hit on the main points, talk about some interesting details, and then we're going to move on. You guys are going to be kind of getting an oversimplification, but I want to cover everything here today. So it's kind of what we have to do. Oh yeah. And then there's one more thing I got to say before we get into this. Today's video is sponsored by Displate. Displates are metal posters and they're kind of a nice alternative to your standard paper poster. These metal posters have really vibrant prints on them and you can choose between a matte or glossy finish. These posters have really nice packaging and the unboxing experience is very nice. Probably one of the nicest things about Displates is that mounting them on the wall is super straightforward. The packaging comes with directions on how to mount them and what you do is you put up the protective sticker, put the magnet on that sticker, and then and you can just put a display on it. And then from there, you can swap out any display on that magnet. Displate has so many different designs you can choose from. I got a bunch of these NASA space themed ones because I thought the colors looked really nice. But also I kind of felt like this dorm wasn't quite going hard enough. You could say it was a little lacking in the hard department. And so to remedy this, I got this bad boy right here. Oh yeah. You can use the discount link in the description to get 22% off one or two displates or 33% off three displates. Also, don't forget to check out Displate's new Textra line of posters. These posters have 3D printed details on them to give it a kind of a cool 3D effect. The blue. During the Cold War, the US Navy basically set up a bunch of underwater microphones in strategic locations across the globe. And what this system was intended to do was to detect Soviet submarines. Based on a lot of the stuff I've read, it looks like it was actually pretty effective. In 1990, the US Navy allowed this other group called NOAA to use this underwater array of microphones for something besides detecting submarines. Instead of detecting submarines with this array of microphones, NOAA wanted to detect underwater Water volcanoes and earthquakes and other seismic activity. In 1997, NOAA detected an extremely loud and strange sound with these microphones that did not sound like anything they had previously recorded. This is what that sound was. Now, when this story first came out, there was a lot of speculation on what this sound was. You know, some people online are speculating that maybe this strange sound was an unknown underwater weapons test. Some people speculated that perhaps there was a enormous sea creature that was making this sound. Pretty awesome. You know, speculation on what this sound was went even beyond that too. Of course, you know, got aliens and shit like that. You know how it is. But down the road, Noah said that they ended up doing some more research and they kind of came to the conclusion that the sound was probably just underwater ice quakes. They put out some stuff that shows that the sound of the bloop seems to line up pretty well with other known underwater ice quakes. So it, the bloop was probably an ice quake. Chris Burden. Chris Burden is an American performance artist who lived from 1946 to 2015. This guy is probably most well known for his pretty insane performance art pieces. I'll just go ahead and list off some of his pieces. Chris Burden went to the University of Irvine and his thesis work was a piece where he lost locked himself in a locker for five days with nothing but a jug of water to drink from and a jug of water to pee in. He did this one piece called Dead Man. For this piece, he basically lied in the road motionless. It looked like he was dead. He put up a bunch of flares next to his body and he basically did this until bystanders called emergency services to get him checked on. This piece led to his arrest. He did a piece in 1973 called 737. For this piece, he shot at a plane with a hand handgun and took pictures of it. Now, an interesting thing about this piece was about half a year after he did this piece, he ended up getting interviewed by an FBI agent
brilliant because, you know, the FBI doesn't really like it when you're taking pictures of yourself shooting at planes. Apparently, though, the FBI ceased their investigation after Chris Burden explained to them that it was just an art piece. And he wasn't aiming that close to the planes. Okay. He did a piece in 1974 where he had his friend nail his hands to the back of a Volkswagen Bug. They then backed the Volkswagen Bug out the back of the garage of their house, rev the engines a couple times, and then drove back in. And that was the that was the piece. He did this piece where he went on a live television show interview and then proceeded to hold the interviewer at knife point in during a live broadcast. Uh, apparently, what he did as as he was holding the interviewer at knife point, he whispered in her ear that this was just part of part of an act and she wasn't actually in danger. But I think some of the other people on set thought this was legit. Surprisingly, the interviewer seemed to be a pretty good sport about this and she never pressed charges. Probably my personal favorite piece from Chris Burden is one called Shoot, where he basically had his friend record him shooting him in the arm. Now, apparently the original intention for this piece was his friend was going to try and shoot him in a way where it just like lightly skimmed past his arm and maybe took a little bit of skin off, but like nothing serious. But when they actually did it, his friend kind of messed up a little bit and actually just basically shot his arm. He was sent to the hospital after this piece. Now, of course, all of these pieces have their own kind of underlying artistic meanings and all that. I'm not going to cover that here because it would make this segment a lot longer. If you're interested, you can, you know, you can look into it yourself. A lot of these do actually have pretty interesting meaning behind them a lot of the time. In Chris Burden's later years, he did kind of switch into more tame sculptural art pieces. You can call them tame. Some of them weren't actually that tame, but some of them were more the Voynich Manuscript. So the Voynich Manuscript is a book that has a written language within it that has never been translated. Till this day, no one knows what the text is saying. All current attempts to try and translate the text have failed, despite this book being super old. Carbon dating suggests that it originally came from the 1400s. Till this day, no one knows who the author of this book is. On top of having a language within it that has never been translated, this book also features some very strange drawings. This book features drawings of plants and like, like tubes of water that move around. Some of the illustrations look like as though they're trying to depict plants in kind of like a medicinal context, like they're trying to outline what plants have what medicinal qualities. And also people aren't exactly sure what plants are being drawn in this book. Plants are kind of drawn in a nondescript way. And so it's kind of hard for even like a botanist to identify what plants are being drawn. The images also depict these long running tubes of water and bathtubs and naked women bathing in the bathtubs. It's kind of crazy. Some of the images in this book almost have kind of like a Dr. Seuss vibe to them. Many different people have looked at this book over the years. A lot of people that you would think would have a pretty good shot at deciphering this book, but no one has really deciphered it in any definite way at this point. The theories of what this book is range from it being some sort of herbal or medicinal guide to it being some sort of like feminine hygiene guide or something along those lines. Some people speculate that this book is actually some sort of strange elaborate hoax. Like the text within it doesn't actually mean anything and the drawings don't actually mean anything. You know, someone might have created this book and acted like it was super valuable and then sold it to someone for a lot of money, even though it's just like some random scribbles. This book has a pretty complex history of people it's exchanged hands from. You know, it's been held by a lot of different book collectors and royalty. The reason this book is widely known as the Voynich Manuscript at this point is because there was a Polish book collector named Voynich who held this book for quite a while and he drummed up a lot of attention to see if he could get people to try and decipher it. He was never really that successful though. Voynich says that he purchased this book off of someone from the Jesuit college near Rome, although it's also possible that he might have stole it from the college and didn't actually buy it off of someone. Voynich held on to the book for the rest of his life until he died. After he died, the book got passed around a little bit more, and after passing hands a couple more times, it ended up at Yale, and till this day, it remains at that Yale library thing they got. There is so much more we could talk about when it comes to the Voynich Manuscript. It seems like there are a handful of leads that might have some potential when it comes to explaining what this book is, but we're not gonna get into that right here. Till this day, this book is still very mysterious and no one really seems to know exactly what it means or what it is about. And if you want to, you can look into those leads yourself. They're pretty interesting, but they don't seem very complete at this point. Lost Wave. Lost Wave is a term that's used to refer to music that has no identifiable origin or artist. So Lost Wave is music that no one knows who created it or where it came from. I have seen some people use the term Lost Wave to just refer to music 
music that has received a little to no attention, but I think it's more typically used just to refer to music that has no known author or origin. On the internet, there are a handful of small communities that are kind of dedicated to identifying the origin and creators of Lost Wave music. On Reddit, there's a community with around 20,000 members that's dedicated to finding the original artist and origin of music that has no known artist or origin. They've done some pretty interesting work. Heaven's Gate. Oh yeah, another thing that I want to point out is there are a handful of entries on this iceberg chart that I have covered in previous videos. And so I'm not going to talk about those ones again very in depth. You know, I've talked about it before. You can go watch the old video. I mentioned Heaven's Gate in a previous video, and I'm sure many of you guys watching this are probably pretty familiar with Heaven's Gate, but probably the most renowned thing to come from Heaven's Gate was a while back, there was a comet called Hailbop that was passing Earth, and the leaders of this cult convinced their followers that there was a spaceship trailing this comet, and if their followers were to end their lives, their souls would be transported onto this spaceship. And after they were transported onto the spaceship, their souls could transcend to the next level of existence. And so almost the entirety of the cult killed themselves at once because they thought they were gonna get onto the spaceship and go to heaven. You know, I'd go more into it, but this is Heaven's Gate. On this side of YouTube, I feel like this is, you know, pretty common knowledge, Bob's Game. So this entry is probably referring to the development of this game called Bob's Game that never really came to fruition. So basically there's this guy named Robert Poloni, and he was the sole developer of this game called Bob's Game. As documentation goes, Bob's Game started development around 2003, and throughout its development, it took many different forms. Robert Poloni, the sole developer, says that he's pretty much completely self-taught when it comes to programming and game development. After being in development for probably like five years, in 2008, Robert Poloni released the first trailer for Bob's Game, and this trailer garnered quite a bit of traction on YouTube for the time. Quite Quite a few different news sites picked up on the development of this game, and a lot of these articles reported that Robert Poloni had spent five years and over 15,000 hours developing the game. And so at this point, you're probably wondering, okay, nice, but what exactly is Bob's game? What do you do in this game? What exactly is the gameplay like? Now, before we get into what the gameplay for Bob's game was supposed to be like, I first kind of want to take a detour and talk a little bit more about the development of this game. Now, for a lot of the development of this game, Robert Poloni was really dedicated to trying to get Bob's game onto the Nintendo DS. He was even like designing the game in a way so that it would specifically work with the DS's two screens. Now, if you want to make a game for the Nintendo DS, you need something called a Nintendo Development Kit. This is basically this special piece of hardware that Nintendo will give you so you can make your game compatible with a Nintendo DS. The thing is, is to acquire this dev kit, you need to get like specific approval from Nintendo. Back during the Nintendo DS Wii era, Nintendo was pretty strict when it came to what games they were going to put on their consoles. Like if you were going to get your game onto a Nintendo system, you were usually going to have to come from a pretty reputable, well-known, decently sized company. Not any Joe Schmo indie guy was not going to get their game onto a Nintendo console at that time. Now, Robert Poloni went to pretty great lengths to get this development kit so he could get his game on the DS. Apparently, he at one point flew to Japan to pitch his game to Nintendo, but apparently during this pitch, he was so nervous and also on drugs that he completely fumbled the pitch and he was basically laughed out of the meeting. This Apparently, wasn't the only time he messed up a pitch with a Nintendo representative. He basically did the same thing twice. It also looks like he sent like hundreds of emails to Nintendo to see if he could acquire the dev kit, but none of these emails seemed to work. All of Robert's attempts to try and get the Nintendo DS dev kit seemed to fail. And all of these failures to get this DS dev kit ultimately culminated and him doing a protest against Nintendo. And what this protest was, was he locked himself in his room for 100 days, live streamed himself online, stuck in his room. Throughout him being locked up in his room for 100 days, he said that this was Nintendo's fault and Nintendo was making him do this because they weren't giving him a dev kit. And he was doing all this in the hopes of that it would draw attention from Nintendo. And I guess he was thinking that doing this 100 day protest would like force Nintendo's hand to give him a Nintendo DS dev kit. As you might imagine, this protest did not work. Nintendo did not even acknowledge that this protest even happened. Also, looking into it a little bit more, it looks like Poloni has admitted that he didn't actually lock himself in his room for 100 days. Apparently, he like put the live stream on loop a couple times and cheated. Also, at one point during this 100 day protest, he faked his death on camera. He like made this giant mess in front of the camera 
and then started laying motionless in it. And a lot of people watching the live stream thought he was actually dead. And like some people watching the live stream ended up calling the cops so they could do a welfare check on him. Beyond this, there are so many other strange things I could talk about that took place during the development of this game. Robert Poloni is a very interesting guy. Okay, now it's time to loop back and kind of talk about what Bob's game actually was like. What was the gameplay like? Well, based on a lot of the early trailers and kind of sneak peeks that were available of the game, it kind of looks like Bob's game was kind of like a earthbound Pokemon type RPG. One of the first playable demos of Bob's game that was released was pretty much just kind of like a pretty standard RPG. You just kind of play as this kid and you go around your hometown and do some kind of fetch quest type tasks and you play mini games that are based off of other classic Nintendo games. However, as development of Bob's game continued, it looks like Robert Poloni kind of integrated some of his real life experiences into this game. And so what I mean by this is as the game kind of went on, it looks like the game kind of turned into this kind of like meta type game where in Bob's game, you would play as Bob who is developing a game. In Bob's game, you would kind of like play through the events of what the game's development was like. So for example, down the road, there was a trailer for Bob's game where it showed like you playing as a character, like confronting Reggie fils so that you could get your game onto the Nintendo DS. Because something like that actually did happen in real life during the development of the game. He did actually confront a Nintendo representative to get his game onto the DS. And he decided to put that into the game. It's kind of unclear if this whole game within a game thing was the original vision for Bob's game, or if this was just something that kind of manifested itself throughout the development of the game because Robert Poloni was getting frustrated with not getting his DS development kit. So continuing forward throughout the development of Bob's game, there is nearly an endless amount of strange details I could talk about that took place. I'm just gonna go ahead and mention a few more kind of like highlight moments during the development of Bob's game. Down the line, Robert Poloni did finally give up on trying to develop his game for the Nintendo DS. But instead of just putting his game on like PC or console, he decided that he was actually gonna create his very own console to put his game on. He hyped this up for quite a while. He said that the console was gonna be able to compete with like the DS and PS Vita, and it was only gonna be $20. It never panned out. Then down the road after that, in 2013, he did release something called Bob's Game, but it wasn't the game he'd been showing off for all these years. Instead, he released this like puzzle game called Bob's Game. And a lot of people were of course pretty disappointed with this. They were expecting like the RPG game that they'd seen footage of and gotten a demo of, but they got this like puzzle game instead. Then after that a little bit, Robert Poloni launched a Kickstarter where he said that he was gonna finally finish Bob's Game if people donated him $10,000. Because at this point, he basically didn't have any money and didn't really have a home. This Kickstarter did actually seem to meet its goal, but but you know, Bob's game still isn't out yet. And I don't think anyone's gotten a refund. Now, one of the most interesting things to come from this Kickstarter campaign was he released a self-written biography. And this biography really kind of gives you a better perspective on who Robert Poloni is and why Bob's game has taken so long to complete. He reveals a lot about himself and what he's been up to in his life. He goes into some pretty personal details, which are kind of crazy. The main takeaway I would say you can get from this biography is the main reason Robert Poloni has not completed Bob's game is because he's kind of suffered from drug addiction and porn addiction and mental issues for the last couple of years. And he's also had a hard time getting housing for extended periods of time. You know, all these factors are not really things you would really want to go up against if you're trying to develop an indie video game. Since 2016, Robert Poloni hasn't really had much of a presence on the internet. And it looks like he's kind of stepped away from the development of Bob's game and he's finally kind of doing something else. At this point, it doesn't really seem like Robert Poloni is going to be in a position to complete Bob's game anytime soon, if ever. I would love to see it, but I kind of doubt they'll find much success. Fresno Nightcrawler. So, you know this video, you know, maybe this is the first time you're seeing this. These creatures in this video are often referred to as the Fresno Nightcrawler. Well, personal story. When I first saw this video, when I was like seven, I thought this was the most unsettling thing ever. I don't know what it is about this video, but the way these bitches move is strange. It is strange. But, you know, looking at this video now, it's kind of 
of just funny. Now, of course, online, you can find people speculating that this video is real and these Fresno Nightcrawlers are actually aliens or some sort of strange cryptid that we've never identified. But it's pretty clear at this point that this video was faked. Captain Disillusion has a great video where he covers this video and he does a pretty good job breaking it down and making it pretty clear that it's fake. They're pretty dope though. Potoser. So I'm gonna run through this one pretty quickly. So if you're from the United States, you've probably heard of the author Edgar Allan Poe. He is often viewed as a really influential writer within the realm of American literature. You know, he, he wrote The Raven. He wrote The Telltale Heart. Now, in 1849, Edgar Allan Poe died under pretty strange circumstances, and his body was buried in Baltimore. And as kind of the story goes, starting in the 1900s, an unidentified man in a black cloak would visit Edgar Allan Poe's grave every year on his birthday and pay a really strange and specific tribute to his grave. He'd pour a glass of Martell cognac, leave three roses at his grave, and leave half of the unfinished bottle at his grave. This is a photo of this supposed cloaked man who would pay tribute. Now, reportedly, this unidentified cloaked man paid tribute to Edgar Allan Poe's grave every year up until 2010. When it comes to my guess on who this unidentified cloaked figure is, you know, pretty sure that it's just like a really dedicated Edgar Allan Poe fan who just really wanted to show his appreciation for his work. But the story seems to have caught quite a few people's attention. Some people speculate that maybe this guy is connected to Edgar Allan Poe in some way, and that's why he's so dedicated to visiting his grave, but that's really just speculation. Moving on, Code Gigas. So Code Gigas literally translates to giant book. And let me tell you, giant book is a giant book. Code Gigas is believed to be the largest preserved medieval manuscript. This is a pretty big ass book, especially considering that it came from the 13th century and it was probably written by a Benedictine monk. This book is reported to weigh 165 pounds and it's made from like a hundred donkey skins. You know, back in the day, they didn't have like printing presses and shit. And so you can see people speculate that this book took five years to create. Some people speculate it took up to like 30 years to create. This book is so big that apparently the museum that currently holds it usually needs two people to carry it around. This book contains a lot of stuff in it. It contains a complete copy of the Bible within it, some copied historical texts, some spells, alphabets. But probably the thing within this book that people gravitate the most towards is the illustration of the devil that can be found within this book. So when it comes to this image of a devil within the book, there's a lot of things that people talk about. For example, there's like this legend related to this book that the monk who wrote this book, the only way they were able to complete this thing was he made a deal with the devil to complete this book. But part of the deal was that like the devil has left his mark on it, I guess. And this image of the devil within this book represents like the marking he left. Of course, this is probably nothing more than a legend. You know, take of that what you will. Probably the most reasonable explanation I've seen for what this book was used for was it was a book made for monks that just had like every useful text in it that they would need. It's just a giant book that covers everything that a monk would need. McCamey Manor. Basically, there's this guy named John McCaney, and over the years, he's hosted a haunted house that puts visitors through really extreme conditions. This haunted house is often referred to as McCamey Manor. McCamey Manor is often referred to as an extreme haunt, and there's rumors out there that signing up for McCamey Manor basically means that you're gonna go to a haunted house where you could like be beaten up, like actually beaten up, and like actually tortured, and actually physically hurt within the haunted house. It looks like there have been versions of this haunted house where people have gone in and basically gotten broken bones, or been dragged behind the back of a car, or just like beaten up, or were waterboarded, or in some cases actually pretty seriously injured. The history of McCamey Manor is not super well documented, but from the looks of it, it looks like the haunted house started out in San Diego, and the haunted house when it was in San Diego was actually pretty intense in some ways. However, in recent years, McCamey Manor has moved to this location in Tennessee, and this haunt in Tennessee is way more lame. The new location in Tennessee is barely even a haunted house. Basically, what happens is you just go to John McCaney's house and he forces you to do physical labor in his yard until it gets so painful and exhausting that you have to give up. Now, over the years, John McCaney has claimed that the mansion has featured some pretty crazy stuff like a 200 meter underwater swim, a two mile long zip line. I think at one point he said that they have like an alligator pit or something. He's also said that there's a $20,000 prize if you get to the end of it. He's made some pretty insane claims on what the manor has 
has had. And these more insane claims are almost certainly completely false. But that's not to say that people haven't been pretty physically hurt during one of these Kami Manor experiences. Of course, it doesn't necessarily take an alligator pit or a zip line to break somebody's arm. As mentioned, from the looks of it, he has broken people's bones before, and he like has dragged people behind a truck down the road. One of the more recent developments within the McKamey Manor story is recently the state of Tennessee started investigating them. They were investigating them because there were reports of them ignoring people's safe words and continuing the experience. They were also being investigated for possibly lying about there being a $20,000 prize and also possibly hurting people doing the experience. Jeff the Killer unedited image. So you know the Jeff the Killer picture? Well, no one is entirely sure where this picture comes from. Now, there's a lot of different speculation on where this picture came from. A lot of people seem to think that the Jeff the Killer image is kind of like a like an edited image of something else, but no one can seem to find what that original source material was. There have been a couple different ideas and leads over the years, but till this day, no one is entirely sure. Some ordinary gamers has a cash prize bounty for anyone who can find the original source material so should probably get looking. 17,776. I talked about this one in a previous video, so I'm not really gonna talk about this one too much. Basically what this is, is like it's this interactive article that tells this story about how in the future, humans will play this strange futuristic game of football. I'm not gonna go much more into detail about this beyond that. You can go check out my old video if you wanna know more. Hello Kitty Murder. So this is a pretty brutal and unfortunate story. So there was this woman by the name of Fan Man Yi, who was born in 1976 in Hong Kong and had a pretty brutal upbringing. She was abandoned as a child. She lived in an orphanage until she was 15. And after she was kicked out of the orphanage, she later became a prostitute. By age 23, she did kind of start getting back on her feet. She got a job, although this was a job as a hostess at a nightclub in Hong Kong. Now, as reports go, at this nightclub, there was a regular by the name of Chan Man Law, Reports about him describe him as a pimp and a socialite, and Fan Man Yi reportedly became one of his regular clients. As reports go, in 1999, Fan attempted to try and steal Chan Man Lok's wallet, but she was later caught stealing, and kind of in retaliation, Chan Man Lok had two of his men abduct her and hold her captive in an apartment he owned. Now, reportedly, the original intention of Chan Man Lok was to pimp her out. From the looks of it, this really never panned out. Chan Man Lok and his men basically ended up holding her captive in this apartment and just tortured her. She was essentially held in this apartment for a month and just tortured. I'm not going to get into the details of what they did, but it's very bad. After about a month of being held captive and tortured, Fan Man Yi did die. And apparently what they did is they broke up her body, boiled it, and then just put it in the household garbage disposal. Notably, when they dismembered her body, they took her severed head and sewed it into a Hello Kitty doll. This situation was eventually reported to the police. The apartment got raided and Chan Man Lok and his men were arrested. Unfortunately, this was of course too late. She had already died. There is quite a bit of gruesome detail I could get into when it comes to this case, but I'm not really interested in doing that. If you want to learn more about this case, there are totally some other sources you can look into. The Monster with 21 Faces. The Monster with 21 Faces is a name used by a person or a group of people who were responsible for a chain of crimes across Japan in the 1980s. Here's kind of the quick rundown of what the monster with 21 faces was doing. So you know Pockies, those like, I don't know, like cracker stick things with chocolate on them? Well, those are made by this Japanese food company called Glyco, and they're a pretty big Japanese food company. Well, back in 1984, the president of Glyco, a man by the name of Katsuhisa Izaki, was kind of just randomly kidnapped from his home and taken to a warehouse in Osaka where he was held captive. Reportedly, Izaki was tied up to a pole inside of a warehouse. Shortly after Izaki was abducted, an executive at Glyco got a call from someone directing them to a ransom note that was in a telephone booth. And this ransom note basically asked for 1 billion yen in exchange to have their executive back. Now, there was a whole police investigation into what was going on. But interestingly, three days after the abduction and after three days of being held in the warehouse, Izaki actually managed to loosen up a that had him tied up and was able to escape and ultimately make it home safe. After Izaki escaped, the police had really no success in figuring out who was behind this abduction, who was behind the ransom, and all that. And this kind of eventually led into the police receiving a letter from a person or a group of people that referred to themselves as the monster with 21 faces. This letter basically taunted the police for their inability to catch the abductors. The letter called them stupid and useless and tax stealers. The letter even kind of goes 
on to give them hints on how they might solve the crime. The letter tells the police what color the car Izaki was abducted in was. For example, following this incident, the monster with 21 faces proceeded to send letters to various other media and news organizations and other food companies, basically taunting them for their inability to figure out who the monster with 21 faces was or to try and blackmail them. They went on to harass a lot of other food companies too. They also went on to start some fires at some glyco facilities and they even abducted another guy at one point too. The monster with 21 faces went on to target this other food company called Morinaga. They sent a letter to Morinaga saying that they intended to plant 20 boxes of Morinaga candy laced with cyanide on store shelves throughout Japan. These candies laced with cyanide were actually later found on store shelves throughout Japan. Interestingly though, these boxes had labels on them that explicitly said that the candies had cyanide and you shouldn't eat them. So it kind of looks like the monster with 21 faces was trying to maybe not kill people, maybe. Probably the best lead for who is behind the monster with 21 faces is there is security cam footage of a man in Osaka placing cyanide lace candy onto store shelves, although this man has never been identified, unfortunately. The monster with 21 faces harassment campaign continued up until 1985. They continuously harassed police departments and food companies and the media with strange and threatening letters. In 1985, a police officer who was head of the prefectural police in Shiga was relieved of his position largely due to his failure in solving the monster with 21 faces case. And shortly after being relieved, he committed suicide by dousing himself in kerosene and lighting himself on fire. Some reports say that his suicide was in part due to his embarrassment in failing to solve the case. Following this police officer's death, the monster with 21 faces sent a letter out to news organizations, basically taunting the police officer's death, but also saying that they were done harassing Japanese food companies and they were moving on. And if anyone moving forward was harassing Japanese food companies, it would not be them. Till this day, no one is really sure who was behind the monster with 21 faces or really even what the motive was. Of course, there's many different theories, but none of them are super solid, it seems like. The investigation into the crimes ended in 2000, and so we might not really ever get a great answer for this. Mad Gasser of Mattoon. So there's this town in the US called Mattoon, and during World War II, there were repeated reports of locals seeing a masked man spray gas into their houses while they were asleep. There were numerous reports of people basically going to bed and waking up only to see like a masked figure at their window or something spraying gas into their house. Some reports say this gas that they were sprayed with had a kind of paralyzing effect. Others say it might have had other effects. Based on all of these reports, some people think that there was basically a guy in Mattoon at some point who was just running around and spraying people's houses with gas for some reason. And no one's really entirely sure why. Some people think that this was just a case of mass hysteria. There never really was a mad gasser of Mattoon. Instead, this was just some sort of mass hysteria that was kind of emerging from the wartime fears. There are also some reports that suggest that the gas that people were breathing in was actually coming from a nearby factory. And the idea of there being a guy spraying gas at people's houses was just paranoia, but there was actually gas getting into people's houses. I've even seen some speculation that this was some sort of sneak attack, spy attack from Japan. Till this day, there isn't really a great answer behind this case. Arnold Schwarzenegger's actual height. So over the years, there are a lot of varying reports on how tall Arnold Schwarzenegger actually is. Some reports say he's 6'2", some reports say he's 5'10", some reports even say he's like 5'5". Five five. You know, there's a lot of different numbers out there for some reason. You know, it's probably possible that Arnold Schwarzenegger has probably stretched the truth a little bit when it comes to his height, but from the looks of it, it looks like in Arnold's heyday, he was probably Probably like six, six one, but as you get older, you know, you shrink a little bit. And so nowadays, Arnold's probably more like 5'11, 5'10. Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir Demikov was a Soviet experimental surgeon who lived from 1916 to 1981. He's often credited as a pioneer and innovator within the realm of surgery and organ transplant. For example, he created the world's first artificial heart and implanted it into a dog successfully. Now, there's a lot more you could talk about when it comes to this guy, but there is one specific thing I personally personally want to mention today when it comes to Vladimir Demikov. He is the first to do a canine head transplant. Now, when I say canine head transplant, what I mean by this is 
He took the head of one dog and sewed it onto the body of another dog. He just took a dog and then basically grafted another head onto that dog's body. Sources say that he actually did quite a few of these surgeries. In fact, he managed to get one of these dogs to live for 29 days after the surgery. This attached head would even react to things. The head would even try and eat things, but since the head was not attached to an esophagus, it would just pass through a tube that was placed in his throat onto the ground. Am Shinrikyu anime. So in case you aren't familiar with Am Shinrikyu, Am Shinrikyu was a cult within Japan during the 80s and early 90s. This cult was led by a man by the name of Shoko Asahara. There is a lot that could be said about this cult. This cult kind of pushed ideas that were a combination of Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Shinto, also like some new age, kind of spiritual self-help stuff. There are, I guess, like techno-futuristic ideas, plus like techno-doomsday cult stuff, I guess. In the West, it seems like the most well-known thing to come from Anshin Rikyu is the Tokyo subway sarin attacks that they did. Now, what this entry is specifically referring to, though, is Anshin Rikyu produced a six-episode anime to kind of outline the beliefs and lore of their leader, Shoko Asahara. I found an upload of it on YouTube. You can watch it, it is it's something else. You know, it's a it's an interesting watch. The anime features an animated version of the actual cult leader, Shoko Asahara. You know, the anime really hypes this guy up to be something special. Scum Manifesto. So I talked about this in a previous video, so we're gonna get the old speedrun treatment. Basically, this woman created this book called The Scum Manifesto. The Scum Manifesto is a book about how the earth doesn't really need men anymore because men are terrible and women can now reproduce by themselves through modern science. This woman who wrote this book, interesting down the line, went on to attempt to murder Andy Warhol, uh, but then she failed. And after this attempt at murder, she was evaluated to have schizophrenia. So yeah, it's a pretty rough case. Carnival of Light. Carnival of Light is a Beatles song that has never been officially released before. So basically the story behind this was a while ago, there was this event in London called the A Million Volt Light and Sound Rave. It was basically just like a rave with a bunch of flashing lights and shit, and you could take LSD. And apparently one of the people that helped host this rave was also friends with Paul McCartney. And at one point, this guy requested that Paul McCartney make a song just for this rave. Like he asked Paul McCartney to produce an exclusive song to be played at this rave. Anyway, as reports go, Paul McCartney did manage to wrangle the Beatles together and produce a song for this rave, and it did get played at the rave. However, the song has never been released publicly. You can find people online who claim to have leaked uploads of it, but I don't think that's real. A Beatles historian guy by the name of Mark Lewison was allowed to listen to this song at one point, and he said that the song was kind of weird, as you might imagine. He described the song as featuring distorted hypnotic drums and organ sounds, distorted lead guitar, the sounds of a church organ, various effects, including water gargling. The song doesn't really have like a melody or anything to it. It's really just kind of like an atmospheric thing with a bunch of random sounds going on. There have been instances of people asking Paul McCartney to release Carnival of Light, but he's gone on record saying that if he were to release something like this, he would want permission from the rest of the Beatles, but some of the Beatles are dead, so he can't get permission from everybody anymore. And so people kind of speculate that they'll probably release this song uh, after he dies. Sabinche Tomatovic tape. So I'm not really going to get into this one too far. Really what this boils down to is there is a really obscure internet rumor that somewhere out there, there's a tape of a woman getting by a spider. It's supposed to be like a giant undiscovered cryptid spider. That's all you need to know. It's almost certainly not real. Timace Dreams. So there's this website called Dream Views, and this website is centered around people just discussing dreams. I think this entry is referring to a post someone made on this website where they describe something called a Timace Dream. I'll just go ahead and read the post. Common elements for these type of dreams are as follows. Occur with some frequency throughout early childhood through natural dreams dreaming or are fever induced, they usually come back briefly in your teens, leave you terrified upon waking, and it still gives you goosebumps to this day to just think about it. Wake with cold sweats, much like a fever. There's a feeling of awful slowness, which is just horrifying. Feels like your soul being ripped out or just sheer insanity. There are geometric shapes present, possibly the platonic solids. Those are the properties of a Timaeus dream. It seems like quite a few people on this website seem to have had a similar experience. I don't really think there is much else to this entry. Cotard's 
syndrome is a pretty rare mental disorder where the patient holds the delusional belief that they are dead. Luna Park train fire. Basically, there was this amusement park called Luna Park, and uh, there was this train ride at the park. And at one point, this train ride caught on fire and killed like seven people. Till this day, no one's really entirely sure how the fire started, but there's a lot of different speculation. Some evidence suggests that it might have been an act of arson, or it also could have been some just stupid accident, like someone dropped a cigarette and it started a fire. Michael Rockefeller disappearance. Michael Rockefeller was a member of the Rockefeller family. He was the great grandson of John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller was one of the richest people of all time. Michael Rockefeller was also son of New York governor and later vice president Nelson Rockefeller. It would be pretty fair to say that Michael Rockefeller was born into a family with a lot of power and wealth. Despite his family's legacy of business and finance, Michael Rockefeller seemed to take more of an interest in the arts. Ultimately, Michael's interest in art and culture led him to going on a kind of art collecting expedition to the Asmat region of Dutch New Guinea, which is now Indonesia. At the time, the people of the Asmat region lived lifestyles that were not particularly technologically advanced. They largely subsisted off the land, and their cultures did feature things like head hunting and cannibalism. Their cultures also had some pretty interesting artistic output. He wanted to meet and document and get art from the Asmat people. While on this expedition in this region, Michael Rockefeller was riding in a catamaran off of the coast of the area. He was riding in this catamaran with a Dutch anthropologist and two Asmat teenagers at the time. This catamaran they were on went on to capsize. The two Asmat teenagers on the boat swam to shore, leaving Michael Rockefeller and the Dutch anthropologist left on the boat alone. Their capsized catamaran began to drift away from shore, and eventually, as reports go, Michael Rockefeller felt like it would be a better plan for him to jump into the water and try and swim to shore instead of trying to wait for rescue. Then, Michael Rockefeller strapped two empty gas cans and attempted to swim to shore. As he swam away, he was never seen of again. No search parties ever managed to find him. Now, it is most commonly believed that Michael Rockefeller just at some point died trying to swim back to shore. It was like a 10 mile swim, so it would be pretty reasonable he just died trying to get there. However, some people have kind of pushed the theory that Michael Rockefeller didn't die while swimming. He did actually manage to swim to shore, but once he got on shore, he was killed by the Asmat people. Notably, there were some Dutch priests within the Asmat area hanging around the Asmat people at the time, and one of these priests reported to have heard through word of mouth that the Asmats actually did find Michael Rockefeller washed up on the shore one day, and they killed him. So though, it should really be said that the Asmat people have been documented to lie and deceive people for their own gain or their own benefit. And so these stories that these Dutch priests heard could totally just be made up. At the end of the day, whether or not Michael Rockefeller made it to shore or not really just comes down to speculation and what you are willing to believe. The Twilight Zone incident. So in 1982, Warner Brothers were producing a Twilight Zone movie called The Twilight Zone. This movie would be based off of The Twilight Zone show. This movie was split up into different segments. This movie actually had multiple directors for the different segments. Just to kind of cut to the chase here, one of the directors in this film was John Landis. Might have heard of this guy before. He was responsible for working on this part of the film that was like this Vietnam War thing. Specifically, there was a scene in the film where an actor by the name of Vic Moreau was tasked with carrying two children in his arms while running away from an exploding building into a river while running away, he was also to be pursued by an American helicopter. You know, it was a pretty intense scene they were trying to film here. During the filming of this scene, though, one of the pyrotechnic explosions on set was bigger than expected, and it knocked the helicopter out of the air, and the helicopter ended up landing on Vic Moreau and the two kids he was carrying and killed them both. People in the helicopter did actually survive. What makes matters worse in this situation is the two kids that were in this scene were illegally hired. First of all, the scene was being filmed pretty late at night, and that alone does violate child labor laws technically. They also didn't have any on-site child welfare workers. <laughs> they did have the workers on set. It looks like they probably would have said no to kids being involved in such a explosive scene. The kids were also being paid under the table. The casting agents were actually unaware that these kids would be on the set at all, and these kids were actually just kind of hired through family friends, basically. Some 
settlements were filed outside of court for the families that had lost their children. But interestingly, nobody was actually ever charged with any crimes beyond just illegally hiring children. So Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon is a book that was published by David McGowan in 2010. Full disclaimer, I have not read the book, but from some of the stuff I've seen online, it looks like this book covers a conspiracy theory about how the hippie movement in the late 1960s was actually engineered by the US government to discredit the anti-Vietnam War movement. It looks like the idea was if we associate the anti-war movement with the hippie movement, it'll make anti-war people look like lazy, drugged out, oddly dressed hippie people. I'd want to actually read the book before I talk about it much further. If I ever do read the book, I might down the road weigh in on the legitimacy of this conspiracy theory down the road, although I will say I'm pretty skeptical right now. Rhythm Zero. So there's this Serbian-born performance artist by the name of Marina Abramovich. She's done quite a few pretty crazy performance art pieces over the years, but Rhythm Zero is the title of probably one of her most well-known performance art pieces. Basically what she did for this piece was she got a bunch of random people from the public in a room with her, and in the room a printed note with the following instructions were left for them. There are 72 objects on the table that one can use on me as desired. Performance. I am the object. During this period, I take full responsibility. Duration, six hours. What these instructions effectively meant for the performance was the audience could do whatever they wanted to her with the provided objects while she just stood there for the next six hours. What were these objects you might be asking? Well, they included, but were not limited to, a rose, feather, perfume, honey, bread, grapes, wine, scissors, a scalpel, a metal bar, a gun and a bullet. Reportedly, the public was pretty tame with how they treated her at the start. Apparently, they just kind of blew her some kisses or would put her hands up into the air or turn her around or something. However, reportedly, as the show went on, the audience began to go kind of crazy. They went on to cut off her clothes and cut her with a knife, and apparently one dude drank her blood from the wound. They assaulted her quite a few times. Apparently, they even reached a point where someone loaded the gun, put it up to her head, and wrapped her own finger around the trigger. Apparently, this move led the people running the venue to step in and get rid of the gun. According to her, everyone actually left the location right after it ended, so she never had the opportunity to confront anybody. Now, of course, online, there's a lot of discussion regarding what the underlying meaning of this piece is. From the stuff I've seen online, it looks like the reason Marina Abramovich did this was because she wanted to see how far the public would take things if she just let them do whatever they want. Alexander Abien. Alexander Abien was an Iranian-born mathematician who taught for over 25 years at Iowa State University. Now, the main thing that this guy is known for is that a handful of news outlets reported that he believed that humanity should blow up the moon. Specifically, a handful of news outlets reported that he thinks that humanity should nuke the moon so the moon stops messing with the Earth's weather. And so we can avoid things like hurricanes and tornadoes and other natural disasters on Earth. Now, of course, this seems pretty ridiculous, and many people have pointed out that blowing up the moon would probably uh, have apocalypse-level consequences. You know, if we really just shot a ton of nukes at the moon and blew it up, it probably would not benefit life on Earth at all. I ended up doing a little more digging into this story because I was thinking, like, does this professor with published papers really think we should blow up the moon or is there something else going on here and i'm glad that i did look into this a little bit more because i think the media reporting on this is largely overlooking the point that he's actually trying to make in one video interview he says that the media misinterpreted what he was saying and then when he re-explains his idea here it seems like more what he's trying to say is the current weather patterns on earth are so devastating to human life thanks to the constant natural disasters that they cause that we should be willing to do anything that we can to change the weather pattern to save people. And if that means blowing up the moon, for example, so be it, we should do it. It's not that he wants to blow up the moon per se, but if blowing up the moon is what it takes to save people, then we should do it. You know, he says he wants to blow up the moon more as like a symbolical thing, I think. I also found this article and it seems like he's trying to make a similar point here too. In fact, in this article, it looks like he explicitly says that we should only blow up the moon if it would be an improvement to humanity. We would need a preliminary study first to make sure it would be beneficial and then we should do it. Area 
Area 62. So I'm pretty sure this entry is referring to how for a couple of years on the internet now, there have been a handful of pictures circulating around of someone in Florida who makes these signs and posters talking about a bunch of insane conspiracy theories. And one of the things they talk about is Area 62. Also online, pictures of this truck have been floating around. And of course, this truck looks like it's probably made by the same person that makes these signs. I looked around online a little bit, but it doesn't look like there's really much more information on whoever's behind this or where this is at. I don't really think there would be much of a story really behind this though anyway. It's probably just like a crazy Florida person who's not in the healthiest place right now. Milton William Cooper was a pretty renowned conspiracy theorist. He had a radio talk show where he would talk about his conspiracy theories. He also wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse where he outlines a lot of his conspiracy theories. And this book seems to have played a pretty decent role in shaping a kind of modern conspiracy theory landscape. Now, when it comes to the specific conspiracy theories this guy pushed, I'm not really gonna get into it. Just like to give you kind of like a taste of what type of conspiracy theories. He'd cover a lot of stuff about aliens, you know, aliens colluding with the government, the government being responsible for AIDS, you know, September 11th being an inside job, fake JFK assassination, the CIA was responsible for the JFK assassination. Although from the looks of it, Milton William Cooper was usually pretty wrong about his conspiratorial predictions for the future. There are a handful of instances of him being right. Although it's kind of like, I guess, intriguing that he was right on a few occasions. I would also say that like even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Now, according to reports in kind of the back end of Milton William Cooper's life, he kind of grew more and more paranoid that the government was out to get him. And it looks like this paranoia kind of led him to harass the people around his house in Arizona. Also in 1998, he was charged with tax evasion and an arrest warrant was issued, but he had managed to just repeatedly avoid serving. I think I'll also just mention how he died. In 2001, some police officers showed up at his house to arrest him for tax evasion and also harassing the people around his house in Arizona. But probably due to Cooper's paranoia that the government was out to silence him, he ended up getting into a shooting with uh, these police officers. And during this shooting, he was fatally shot in the head. Some people have looked at this situation and say that it is evidence that Milton William Cooper was actually being followed by the government and this was them silencing him. DMT Nexus. DMT Nexus is a website that covers pretty much anything DMT related. There's forums, there's guides, you know, it's got everything DMT related. DMT is a pretty strong psychedelic drug and this website has pretty much anything you could want to know about it on it. Foe.org. If you go to this website, you know, if you don't know what's going on, it probably looks pretty crazy. You now there's a lot of like winding pathways on this website you can go down and there's some pretty crazy art on it. This is just a Serial Experiments Lane fan website. And when you consider that, this website makes a lot more sense. Serial Experiments Lane is just an anime. Pier Paolo Pasolini. Pier Paolo Pasolini is a pretty interesting Italian guy. He's pretty hard to describe in broad strokes though. He's probably most popularly known as a poet and a filmmaker, but you know, he did a lot of other stuff too. You could also say he was a political activist. You know, he was communist and he was gay, but he also heavily supported the Catholic Church and he also had pretty conservative beliefs when it came to Italian society. His film discography was pretty wide ranging in terms of the output. On one hand, he produced the movie The Gospel According to Matthew, which is a pretty straightforward retelling of the story of Jesus. But he also went on to later drop 120 Days of Sodom. And uh, this movie is set in fascist Italy. And what happens is some Italian elites get together in a mansion. They get a bunch of teenagers and they torture them and kill them. And they kind of get off to it. This movie is pretty hard to watch. Some people would probably even consider it like a borderline, like gross out film type thing. People also say though, it has some valuable commentary to it. I'll let you look into that more if you wanna know. People are eating human shit in this movie. His body was found dead on a beach in Italy one day and no one was really sure what the cause of death was. Some evidence seems to suggest that he was killed by a male prostitute that he was driving around. Although other evidence seems to suggest that he was possibly murdered by a gang that he had bad blood with. Everyday Chemistry. So here's another Beatles related entry on the iceberg for some reason. Everyday Chemistry is a Beatles remix album that was released in 2009. I listened to it and it's pretty good. I was pretty solid. Some of the remixes do some pretty interesting creative stuff. Some of them aren't the greatest and have kind of bad mixes, but overall it's kind of like a cool idea. Now there is also kind of like a story or some lore that's attached to this album. So back in 2009, somebody 
somebody made a website where they claimed that they had basically somehow traveled to an alternate dimension and they got this album from this alternate dimension and brought it back to our dimension for us. The guy behind the website claims that this is actually just a normal Beatles album, but from like another dimension and he brought it home to us. Also, interestingly though, you know, forgetting all the lore stuff and whatever, no one is actually sure who made this remix album. It seems like there are a couple different leads, but no one really seems to be like certainly positive on who made this. John C. Lilly. John C. Lilly graduated from Caltech in 1938. He then later studied at Dartmouth and Pennsylvania University and went on to receive a medical degree. After this, he ended up working for various government bodies doing research within the realm of psychiatry and medicine. Some of his research and findings seem to be pretty well regarded within scientific communities, but kind of down the line in his career, it looks like he kind of started doing research and more kind of eclectic things, I guess. John C. Lilly is often credited as inventing deprivation tanks. In case you don't know what that is, deprivation tank is basically like a tank of water that's been heated to exactly skin temperature. It's also been filled with like Epsom salts. So when you get into it, you feel weightless. You don't feel the water on you because it's the same temperature as you. And the Epsom salts make it so you like are perfectly weightless within the water. A lot of the time, deprivation tanks will also be in a completely dark environment where you can't see anything. Sometimes some deprivation tanks will even have you wear some sort of like breathing mask so you can lay face down in the water without having to worry about moving around to breathe and you can just kind of like take it in or I guess like take in the lack of anything because it's a deprivation tank. This is what John C. Lilly's personal deprivation tank looked like. Interestingly too, down the road, John C. Lilly began experimenting with taking drugs and then going into deprivation tanks to just kind of see what would happen. You know, he took LSD and ketamine and a couple other drugs and went into self-deprivation tanks. From these experiences, he reported seeing some pretty insane shit. At one point, he reported to have met the council that controls our section of the universe while doing this. Also down the line, Lily started researching dolphins a lot. He ended up building a dolphin research facility on the San Francisco coast. And the goal of this facility was to try and decipher dolphin language. John C. Lilly seemed to hold the belief that dolphins were way smarter than we give them credit for and humans should aspire to try and communicate with them. Lowe's dolphin research did make some discoveries about dolphins that were not previously known. Ultimately, he did not manage to decipher dolphin language. Also, some pretty strange things came about from his dolphin research. One of his assistants ended up having like a sexual relation with a dolphin. It was a whole thing. That's a story for another time. School Days Delayed Due to Murder. So School Days is a slice of life harem dating visual novel. It was originally like a PC visual novel. As far as visual novels go, it looks like it's largely pretty standard stuff. You know, you play as a lead male character. You can decide to romance various girls within the visual novel. Depending on what decisions you make, you get different endings to the visual novel. Some of these endings good, some of these bad. Sometimes you end up with this girl, sometimes you end up with this girl. But this visual novel does have one element that is kind of interesting. The element of this visual novel that is kind of interesting is that there are some endings to this visual novel where things can get pretty brutal. There's a pretty iconic ending you can get where if you portray one girl early in the story and then get with another girl, at the end of the story, the girl you betrayed will push the new girl into an oncoming train and kill them. And then that's just the, that's the end of the story. It just gets really dark out of nowhere. I've never played through this visual novel. It looks like reviews for it are pretty mixed. Some people seem to like it. Some people seem to think it's not really that great. Later, this visual novel was adapted into a manga and an anime. In the anime, on the very final episode, this one girl ends up stabbing this other girl to death out of jealousy because like the main character decided to choose this girl over her. And this final episode was set to air on September 18th, 2007 on a Japanese TV station called Kanagawa. However, just a day before this final episode in a completely unrelated situation, in Kyoto, a 16-year-old girl murdered her 45-year-old father with an ax. Now, due to this murder kind of sharing some similarities with the final episode of this anime, out of respect, TV Kanagawa decided to pull this final episode from air. And instead of showing this episode, they decided to air what it was basically like 30 minutes of stock footage of like European lakes and boats and stuff. They did later end up airing this episode anyway, but this situation ultimately kind of led to the nice boat meme if you've ever seen that. After this weird airing thing happened on 4chan, some people were joking about this thing happening and someone posted a picture of the weird boat stock footage and someone replied, nice boat. And now it's a meme 
name to just say like nice boat because it's random and funny you know how it goes soku shinbutsu so within japan there's a religion called shugendo not a very big religion it only has about six thousand practicing members the religion seems to be kind of a combination of buddhism shinto and taoism now there is a lot you could talk about when it comes to this group but i'm just gonna focus on what the iceberg chart is specifically talking about soku shinbutsu so soku shinbutsu is something that has often been described as self mummification the practice basically involves staying on a strict diet to try and lose as much body fat as possible you would be restricted to eating pretty much only what you could like forage around for in the forest so like seeds and nuts and roots eventually you would also start cutting off water and after fasting for a while you would get buried alive in a tomb this tomb would be connected by a bamboo shoot to the above air so the person inside of the tomb could stay alive and breathe for a while and due to this really restrictive dieting procedure that you would do before you get into this tomb when you did eventually die in this tomb your body would be preserved there would be really no nutrients within your body for any bacteria or parasites to feed off of and so your body would just kind of stay preserved pretty well accelerationism so accelerationism can mean different things depending on the context but usually when you see accelerationism online usually the thought process behind accelerationism is moving forward everything in humanity is just gonna get worse no matter what for example we can try and you know can preserve the environment or or prevent all money accumulating at the top or preserve traditions or whatever we can try our best eventually everything is all going to collapse and so we might as well accelerate towards the collapse of everything some people seem to think we should accelerate towards this collapse so then we have the opportunity to rebuild better afterwards but some people don't even attach that notion to it some people think we should just i mean we got nothing better to do let's just hurry things up and collapse nick land nick land is probably one of the most popular proponents to accelerationism he's often seen as one of the main people who fathered accelerationism for film production so there's this couple noel marshall and tippy hedron as the story goes this couple went on a trip to mozambique for work during this trip to mozambique they went to gorongosa national park and on this trip they saw an abandoned plantation house that had been overrun by lions this experience that this couple had seemed to ultimately inspire them to want to create a film involving lions and other big cats to create this film the couple began collecting lions in their house in LA. Eventually, they were busted for keeping big cats in their house without a permit, and they ended up moving to a ranch outside of LA where they started collecting even more big cats. Reportedly, this ranch ended up accumulating over 90 lions, tigers, and other big cats, along with other animals, including two elephants and flamingos. This ranch would also be the set for where they would film their lion movie that they had dreamed of. After they finished the script for this lion movie, they of course began filming it. However, the filming process of this movie was incredibly diseased and had roadblock after roadblock and they ran into just so many issues filming. Although the lions had been raised around humans for much of their life, they weren't exactly trained by any means. And so this led to a lot of problems. Some reports say that there was as many as 70 injuries throughout the filming of this movie. I mean, just to name a few reported injuries, one dude was scalped by a lion on set. The, the main actor guy ended up getting dragged around by a lion and had to get like reconstruction surgery one dude got bit by a lion and then ended up getting a blood infection one girl like fell off of an elephant and like broke her back also other roadblocks that this film faced was like you know in a couple cases some of the lions ended up breaking loose from the ranch at one point there was a flood at one point the ranch caught on fire the film ended up taking five years to produce and it cost 17 million dollars however when it finally did come out it pretty much flopped it only earned like two million dollars at the box office the film would go on to be called roar when it was released and as far as the plot goes it's not really that good the plot of the film basically comes down to a family unknowingly ends up at this lion sanctuary and then they get chased around by the lions in scooby-doo-esque chase scenes for like 70 minutes the plot of the movie is not very good the dialogue of the movie is not very good but i will say the movie is kind of interesting when you consider that all of the actors on screen are running around with real actual lions and when the actors look scared on screen they probably are actually pretty scared in real life too because i mean these lions were largely untamed Hoffenberg. i think what this entry is referring to is if a pregnant woman dies as her body starts decomposing gases can like build up in her body and under certain circumstances the build of these gases can actually lead to the mother's body basically ejecting the unborn child from her body and this is referred to as a coffin birth there are quite a few documented cases of this taking place so an entheogen to my understanding is just a 
psychoactive substance that is used for more spiritual or religious purposes as opposed to like recreational purposes. Peter Pavelinsky is a artist and social activist from Russia. He's probably most well known for his artistic protests against the Russian government. Just to name some of his most well known protests, back in 2012 when the band Pussy Riot was arrested, Pavelinsky did a protest where he literally sewed his mouth shut. You know, he did this other protest in 2012 where he had some of his assistants strip him down and roll him in barbed wire and his assistants basically took him and placed him in front of the legislative assembly of St. Petersburg and he just kind of sat there until police came and cut him free. This one seemed to be kind of protesting some of the new laws that were passing that were infringing on people's personal freedoms. Probably his most well-known protest was when he nailed his nutsack to the ground in Red Square. That happened. Purportedly, this was kind of in protest of how he perceived that, like, at the time, the Russian people were being very apathetic and indifferent when it came to the current kind of Russian political climate at the time. Deagle Nation. So the quick and dirty on Deagle Nation is there was this YouTube channel called Parkour Dude 91 and this channel was ran by a guy who went by Jace Connors. He would upload videos where he would act super macho and act like he was a former Marine but also he lived with his mom and was unemployed. He would also yap about guns in video games and say some pretty insane and ridiculous shit. And despite being a really lame and incompetent person, he'd have illusions of grandeur. He also claimed to have created a gang called Deagle Nation, who were like his followers, who were just as dedicated to the gamer marine neat lifestyle as much as him. Now in these videos, Jace Connors would go to some pretty crazy lengths to ham things up and look as crazy as possible. Possible. His crazy antics kind of ended up landing him a spot as a lol cow on websites like Kiwi Farms and a couple other places. The thing was, is that at the end of the day, Jace Connors ended up being fake and all the stupid stuff he was doing was just an act for the sake of being funny. It turns out Jace Connors was just a character played by a guy by the name of Jan Rankowski. From what I can tell, the initial discovery that really revealed that his videos were all a ruse was people ended up finding a connection between him and Sam Hyde. And of course, if someone's doing something like this, but they're linked with Sam Hyde, it's probably not very legit. Poorly Planned Comics. Poorly Planned Comics is a webcomic series. Although the original website hosting this series has been taken down, there still are archives available of it online. Now this might seem kind of weird to say, but this comic series is insane. This comic series features so many different characters and keeping track of what's going on requires the reader to pay insane attention. The comic is also constantly breaking the fourth wall. It's pretty much never not breaking the fourth wall in some way. And due to the just constant fourth wall breaks in the comic, it kind of gets hard to keep track of what's even going on. Also, the comic will just kind of switch up sometimes to take on a really serious philosophical tone and it's really jarring. And it also looks like throughout the comic series, there's a hidden puzzle, but from what I can tell, till this day, no one's really solved the puzzle. Now, this comic series is pretty long, so I haven't been able to thoroughly go through it yet, but I have skinned through it, and it's just crazy through and through. Probably the most notable edition of the comic is the very last issue of it. The very last edition of this comic is literally a suicide note from the author. If you're reading this, I am dead. I've gone to the Madison Marriott West Hotel, taken the elevator to the 10th floor, and jumped off the balcony into the atrium. Comic is my last will and testament. P.S. If you want to know why I killed myself, the story is here. It's long though. The link that he left to the document that is supposed to explain why he killed himself is pretty hard to understand. It's really long and rambling and it's a collection of emails. It's pretty hard to tell what's going on. The author of this comic was a man by the name of Jack Masters. There are quite a few reports of a man named Jack Masters dying that line up strikingly well with the suicide note. It looks like this guy probably did actually kill himself. Jack Masters left a huge trail of activity on the internet that is really revealing and gives us a pretty good look into what he was like and why he did what he did. From what I've seen, Jack Masters was probably a really talented and smart artist and game designer, but it also looks like he was a really troubled person with some sort of mental issues. I would want to talk more about Jack Masters, but the rabbit hole when it comes to him runs so deep that no one on the internet has really been able to organize Jack Masters' full story yet. I haven't been able to really organize the full story behind him yet either. 
I might revisit this topic in the future when I have a better understanding of who Jack Masters was. Helios. So Helios is the game that you're looking at right here. There are two Helios games and they're both shareware games for MS-DOS. Now these games are pretty strange. Helios 1 opens with a message from the developer, Sean Puckett, claiming that he didn't actually make these games himself. Instead, apparently one night he was awoken by an alien entity that was an exact replica of him. This alien entity broke into his house and put this game onto his computer's hard drive. Now, this story is of course pretty much certainly false. Sean Puckett has gone on to refer to this story as silly and like, really, would you believe that? But that's not to say that these games aren't really strange anyway. After you get past the message from the developer in Helios 1, the game opens to a level select screen that looks like this. You get this tentacle thing and you move it around so you can select a level that you're gonna play. Also, you can manipulate these symbols on the edge here and you have to manipulate them into the right order to beat the game and you have to find the right code of symbols. To get the right symbols, you have to play levels and the levels look like this. The gameplay is really tedious and challenging. If you beat all the levels though, you can finish the code and the end screen of the game looks like this. There's really no explanation on what this means and this end screen just repeats forever until you decide to quit the game. Helios 2 is pretty much the same thing as Helios Helios 1 but with new levels. Really the only thing about Helios 2 that's different is that the game is unbeatable. It looks like when the game was released it was left in an unfinished or buggy state and so you just can't activate the end screen. It looks like no one online is entirely sure why the game is unfinished. Over the years these games seem to have kind of caught the imagination of quite a few people online. It looks like some people actually are open to the idea that these games were made by aliens or whatever. You know people have made creepypastas about these games. Uncanny Valley Predator. So what this is referring to is basically the idea of the Uncanny Valley is as artists create things that look more and more realistic, they eventually reach a point where they look realistic enough to the point where you can almost believe they're real, but not quite. They're in this like strange zone where it's almost real, but it's not quite. And this weird strange zone is known as the Uncanny Valley. So the idea of the Uncanny Valley Predator though, is that you might ask yourself, so why is it that humans find things that are almost real but not quite real uncanny and creepy why do we do that what's the point of that well some people have speculated that the reason humans find stuff like this creepy is because at some point in our past humans had to face some sort of like predator or something could disguise itself as a human and if we were able to detect that it was actually a predator in disguise we would survive better and so we evolved this trick the idea is like humans at some point had to face some sort of like alien creature that could disguise itself as human but if humans were like smart enough and aware enough to be like oh that's not quite human almost human but not quite they would survive better and then they evolved the trait to identify things within the uncanny valley people have been batting around this idea on the internet for a while now lady of the dunes in july of 1974 a 13 year old girl was walking in the race point dunes in province massachusetts reportedly while walking her dog led her to a dead body in the dunes when this body was found it was badly decomposed the body Body was missing its hands, its neck had been crushed, its face had been seemingly smashed in to some extent, and the body was missing some teeth. Throughout the coming years, this case made little progress. Although there were quite a few different leads, none of them seemed to lead to the actual killer of this woman. This body was found in 1974, and then it wasn't until 2022 that this body had finally been identified. The FBI website says that the reason it took all the way until 2022 to identify this body was because it wasn't until until recently that DNA analysis techniques had become advanced enough to make identification of this woman possible. They identified this woman as Ruth Marie Terry. Later in 2022, they were able to pin down the murder of this woman as a guy named Rockwell Moldovan. Ruth and Rockwell were married shortly before Ruth was murdered. Rockwell Moldovan had actually died back in 2002. They pinned the murder on him after he had died, so justice was, you know, never really served here. Happy Science Anime. So, Happy Science Science is another Japanese cult that started in the 1980s. The beliefs of this group are also pretty complicated. It's another kind of strange blend of Eastern and Western religions and also New Age self-help. This cult also features a lot of elements of like channeling other beings and aliens and reptilians and stuff like that. You know, I would tell you more about the intricacies of this religion and the lore behind it and how it all works out, but I'm gonna tell you how you can figure it out yourself. Happy Science has produced 
numerous animes basically explaining the lore behind their religion. You know, these animes are really something special. The animation is actually pretty okay a lot of the time, but the plots are just insane religious stuff. Indianapolis wrecking ball theft. So yeah, I mean, there are a handful of newspapers from the Indianapolis area that report a wrecking ball theft, a stolen wrecking ball. There are a couple newspapers that literally report that a wrecking company one night left their wrecking ball on the crane and then they came back the next morning and then the wrecking ball was gone. Now, the reporting on this thing is a little bit spotty. Some reports say that the wrecking ball was as big as five tons, while others say it was only about 50 pounds. Some reports say that the wrecking ball was 200 feet in the air, while others say it was only like 20 feet in the air. You know, depending on what numbers are true, that kind of determines how crazy this story really is. 50 pound, 20 feet high ball, you could probably steal that overnight. But five ton, 200 foot ball, kind of hard. So even if it wasn't the biggest wrecking ball ever, and it wasn't the highest up, there still seemingly was a wrecking ball that was stolen from a wrecking company in Indianapolis back in the 70s. I've seen some people speculate that this might have been an example of like insurance fraud. The company kind of stole the wrecking ball from themselves so they could file a claim. Henry Siwiak murder. Henry Siwiak was the only recorded murder in New York on September 11th. That was unrelated to the other thing that happened there that day. Siwiak was a Polish immigrant. He had moved to the US so he could make money here and send it back to his wife in Poland who was taking care of his two kids. He had taken up a job in New York mopping floors at a supermarket. The story goes, one night Siwiak was trying to get to the store, so he asked his landlady for directions on how to get there. She gave him the wrong directions and he ended up in a pretty bad part of New York, an area that was widely known for crime at the time. While walking through the area, he ended up getting shot and till this day, no one knows who shot him. It's been a cold case for over 20 years now. No one knows who shot him. No one knows why they shot him. You know, some people have speculated that he might have been murdered due to people mistakenly believing him to be related to the 9-11 attacks. The Warrens of Virginia. The Warrens of Virginia is a silent film that was released in 1924. Based on what I've read about this movie, it was about two people who grew up being childhood sweethearts, but then after the Civil War broke out, the dude ended up working as a lieutenant for the Union Army, while the girl ended up being kind of associated with the Confederacy, and so the couple were split apart, and the movie's kind of like a drama that relies on this premise. Now, I'm not entirely sure why this movie is on this iceberg chart, but I've, there's two things I can think of. First of all, this movie is a piece of lost media. It doesn't look like there's any actual archive of this film anywhere. Another kind of interesting thing about this film is during the making of this film, there was an actor working on it named Martha Mansfield. She was a pretty well-known actor at the time. After filming a scene for the film on November 29th, 1923, she went to go take a break in her car. And now no one's entirely sure how this happened, but somehow while in her car, the Civil War War costume she was wearing ended up catching on fire. And the burns that she got from her dress catching on fire ended up killing her just a day later. Till this day, no one's really sure how her dress caught on fire. You know, some people think that could have just been like a loose cigarette bud somewhere that just got on her dress somehow and it started the fire. You know, maybe someone else was in the car with her that dropped a cigarette on her. There are seemingly some reports from people who say that they saw someone walk up to the car and like throw a match in and then that caught her dress on fire. So there could have maybe been sabotage. Some people speculate that she was just smoking a cigarette and then it lit her dress on fire. Till this day, no one's really sure how it happened. She was still largely left in the film, although her role was changed a lot and a different actor kind of took the star role for her. Baki case. So this is a really, really rough situation. I'll give you an idea of what's going on, but I'm not going to get into it too much here. So basically in Japan, there was this adult film production group known as Baki Visual Planning and they were a super predatory and deceptive group when it came to getting women to feature in their adult films that they were producing. There are reports that say that this company basically would convince women to star in their adult films only for them to get on set and then basically just horrifically torture them on camera without their consent. Although most of the people behind this group were arrested, it was still not a great situation. Law of One. This entry is referring to a series of texts known as the Raw texts. So what the raw text is, back in the 1980s, a group called LL Research was formed. These people came together and worked together through a shared interest in aliens and spirituality. And so bear with me, this group came together and claimed to have channeled an alien by the name of Raw. In 
and through channeling Ra, Ra gave them kind of wisdom and knowledge about the universe that they transcribed into what we know as the Ra text. That's what the Ra texts are. They're a transcription of these people channeling this alien. So what did Ra say when he was channeled by these people? What, what do the Ra texts say? There's a lot to go through. You know, Ra said a lot of stuff, but one of the main things in the Ra text is something that is called the Law of One. From my understanding, the Law of One is kind of the idea that every conscious being and everything in the universe is actually one single thing. However, this whole unified single being has split itself up into what feels like separate beings so it can better understand itself. And so the reason it feels like you're experiencing life as like a single ununified being is because the universe is like deceiving you to do that so you can help the universe understand itself. Beyond this idea of the law of one, Ra talks about some other stuff in these texts. He mentions that beings in the universe can transcend different dimensions of like life. So the text outlines that there's like seven different dimensions of being. Humans are currently in the third dimension. Ra, this alien that they're channeling, is currently a sixth dimensional being. And depending on what actions one does, they can either like climb up a dimension or go down a dimension. There's other stuff that's said in the Ra text that Ra actually came to Earth like 13,000 years ago and helped the Egyptians build the pyramids. And now it's like a universal energy source or something like that. And then the lizard people came and you know, there's a lot of that type of stuff within the Ra text as well. ET friends. So there's this website called ET friends. And this website largely outlines the supposed discoveries of a woman by the name of Joanne Ocean. Joanne Ocean apparently discovered that dolphins are multidimensional beings that have powerful spiritual properties. And she is capable of communicating with dolphins telepathically. She also has discovered that dolphins are actually creatures from another universe that have come to Earth to help humans pair for the other aliens that we're eventually going to meet. On this website, she also outlines that there are alternate dimensional alien beings that she can communicate with and dolphins help her communicate with them. She also believes in a lot of other stuff that I would say pretty squarely falls within the court of like new age spirituality stuff. Now, you know, there's a lot of things you could poke fun of when it comes to a website like this, but I'm going to talk about my favorite part about it. Joanne Ocean owns like a property in Hawaii somewhere. And on this website, you could sign up to stay at her ranch property for a couple days and hang out with Joanne Ocean, where she would kind of like take you on the Joanne Ocean special. Like during the day, you would be able to stay, you know, on her property and you'd be able to kind of like participate in like meditative practices with her so you could talk to some aliens. During the day, they would take you on a tour to go find some dolphins. And I think she would like talk about like communicating with dolphins and stuff like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like you can book a stay with Joanne Ocean on her property anymore. Back in 2022, Hawaii banned people from getting within 50 meters of spinner dolphins and going out to meet spinner dolphins was a pretty big part of signing up to go hang out with Joanne Ocean. And it looks like now that they can't do that, they just don't really offer the whole thing anymore. In 1995, Virginia State Police set out to investigate a car crash in Emporia, Virginia. Upon arriving, they found a wrecked Volkswagen Vanagon with two dead passengers partially ejected from the front windshield. The driver of the vehicle was pretty quickly identified as 21 year old Michael Hager, a University of South Carolina student. However, the second guy in the vehicle was not nearly as easy to identify. The crash left his body in pretty bad shape and so he was really hard to identify. They couldn't really release any pictures of his face. Really the only hints as to who this guy was, was at the crash site there was a note that was found that seemed to suggest his name was Jason. There were two used Grateful Dead tickets. He was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt and those were like really the only unique details about the guy that could be found. For many years, this guy remained completely unidentified. No one knew who this passenger was. Even the family of the driver in the vehicle had no idea who this person was. They had never seen him before. They did not know why their son was driving with him. Now, down the road, we did get various sketches and reconstructions and renders of what this person probably looked like. And after these images started emerging, various web sleuthing communities started kind of trying to figure out who this guy was. Someone who was kind of involved in the web sleuthing community made this image and they started circulating it around Imager. And thanks to the circulation of this image, some people who thought that they knew who this guy was ended up reaching out to them. And they suggested that this person might have been a man by the name of Jason Callahan. This led to quite a few people on the internet theorizing that this unidentified person from 1995 was in fact Jason Callahan. Eventually, the family of Jason Callahan ended up seeing these posts saying that how Jason might have been the missing person. And the family ended up 
up taking a DNA test and it turns out that this person who died in 1995 in fact was their son. Kind of an interesting part of this story is Jason Callahan's family wasn't really even under the impression that their son was dead at this point. Jason's mom had assumed that he had just kind of run away and he was purposely trying to stay away from them. Apparently the last time she saw him was in 1995, just a few months before he ended up dying in that car crash. But she never knew that he died in the car crash. She had thought that he was just out there somewhere doing stuff. Cool theory. So in 2008, a new search engine launched called Cool. When this search engine was set to launch back in 2008, quite a few different news outlets hyped this thing up to be like a Google killer or a major competitor to Google. And to be fair, at the time, it looked like Cool had a much bigger index of things it could search through compared to Google. It also had quite a few little quality of life things over Google at the time. Uh, not to mention, Cool was being spearheaded by people who had actually previously worked at Google. Although Cool looked pretty good on paper, when Cool actually became available to the public, it was not received well. The website would crash a lot. You know, it would not return search results fast. Also, a lot of the time, the search results that it would give you would be pretty far removed from what you were actually looking for. This led to Cool failing uh, just a couple months after it launched. The failures of Cool kind of became a joke, and this led to one day some people on Reddit were joking around about this, and so this kind of led to people joking that Cool should be a unit of measurement to denote how far removed something is from the reality of things. I'll just read you off this Reddit post because it explains the joke better than this. Can we make a Cool a unit of measurement? One Cool equals one level of abstraction away from the reality of a situation. Example: You ask me for a hamburger. One Cool. If you asked me for a hamburger and I give you a raccoon. At two Cules, if you ask me for a hamburger, but it turns out I don't really exist. Where I was originally standing, a picture of a hamburger rests on the ground. At three Cules, you wake as a hamburger. You start screaming, only to have special sauce fly from your lips. The world is in sepia. Why are we speaking German? A mime cries softly as he cradles a young cow. Your grandfather stares at you as the cow falls apart into patties. You look down, only to see me with pickles for eyes. I am singing the song that gives birth to the universe. And then the post goes on to just like take this farther and farther. This Reddit post eventually turned into a copy pasta. R slash past Saturn's rings. So the Saturn time cube theory is called differing things depending on where you look. And the conspiracy theory seems to kind of blend in to other conspiracy theories. But when people are talking about the Saturn time cube theory, what they're often referring to is the conspiracy theory that, okay, this is like crazy shit, so bear with me. So Saturn has this giant hexagon-shaped storm on it and kind of looks like a cube in a way if you like think about it like this. So the conspiracy theory says that anytime you see like a black cube in the media or really anywhere, that is just like a, like a discreet way of like the government and companies trying to like trick you into worshiping Saturn. Now, this conspiracy theory also says that like Saturn powers or controls the simulation that we live in and that giant like hexagonal shaped storm on the bottom is actually like a supercomputer that's powering the simulation that we live in. It's a crazy conspiracy theory. It is so many cules removed. Now it's kind of hard to pin down exactly where this kind of conspiracy theory about the Saturn time cube originate from but from the looks of it it seems that most of the stuff regarding the Saturn time cube theory ultimately originate from an author by the name of Nick Hinton who wrote a book about this stuff. Now, within the realm of the Saturn time cube theory, you, you see people like claim so much crazy stuff. Like this video right here is claiming that the rings of Saturn are satellite dishes that are being used to project a 3D matrix onto the Earth, powering the simulation we live in. The Saturn time cube theory genre of conspiracy theories is, in my opinion, like the pinnacle of brain rot conspiracy theories. Like it does not get any more insane and like mind rotting than this. Past Saturn's rings, the thing that's actually on the iceberg chart is just a reddit community that kind of revolves around the saturn time cube theory god's ego death so the term God's ego death did appear on an iceberg chart that I covered in a previous video, but looking back on it, the explanation that I provide for God's ego death in that video is not really the greatest. Nowadays, if I had to give my honest thoughts on what the term God's ego death is referring to on this iceberg chart, I would say that it probably doesn't actually refer to like a specific conspiracy theory on the internet that people believe. The first time that I can find the term God's ego death showing up on the internet in any meaningful way way is on one of these conspiracy theory charts. My speculation is that someone kind of just 
randomly, thoughtlessly put it on to one of these conspiracy theory charts a while back, and then people kind of retroactively came up with an explanation for what it was referring to, and then that kind of snowballed into the term ending up on more iceberg charts down the road. Nujishian meat cycle. Nugitshian? I don't know how to pronounce it. This one's pretty weird. So there's this website called 973etnamu973. This website is huge. It has a ton of different pages. These pages are filled with endless numerical puzzles and weird art pieces to look at. This website also has a forum section that seems to draw in a lot of pretty strange critters that like to talk about spiritual, new age, religion type stuff. This website has kind of been a mystery on the internet for quite a while because no one's entirely sure what the point of it is. One thing that is known about the website is the domain is registered under a man by the name of Dave Dennison. And it looks like a lot of the website is just an art project by Dave Dennison. It's still kind of unclear what the point of the website is and who's currently running it because Dave Dennison died quite a few years ago. There's been a lot of speculation over the years that this website might be ran by a cult or some sort of religion that revolves around numerology or something. So, okay, to get back on track though, what Nujishian Meat Cycle is specifically referring to is a while ago, someone on the forum section made a post about something called the Nujishian Meat Cycle. Now, what's a Nujishian Meat Cycle, you might be asking? I have no idea. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. The explanation that this writer provides for the Nujishian Meat Cycle is really cryptic and hard to follow. His explanation really just beats around the bush and doesn't really make any sense. These graphs are provided, but they don't make any sense either. The dude who originally posted about the Nujishian meat cycles says that if you DM him, he'll explain it more to you. I did DM him and I have not gotten a response yet, so I don't know. I kind of doubt I'm ever going to get a response from him. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Man, it's it's five in the morning right now. I just finished recording this. It's actually 530 in the morning right now. Thank you so much for watching this video. And if you stuck around to see what my channel does, even if I don't upload super frequently. You a real one for real for real. Uh -oh.